I think that just as we're living in a nuclear age, we have grown so tremendously in scientific knowledge, it doesn't seem uh, too much to say that men can begin to awaken to the fact that they have, haven't grown enough spiritually and haven't recognized their spiritual capacities. Once something like eating is death, then you've struck at the very heart of life. The enemy of the older radical theories may have been the ruling class, but today the stakes of whether we will reform ourselves into a new kind of human being, a new kind of society, whether we will find selves worth being, the stakes of it are simply life itself. Modernity has created promises that it has no ability to keep. What this means is that we're a society of disembedded individuals um, stuck in the impossible situation of being alone together. And what was understood as emancipation has proved to be a form of isolation. It is important to understand that what I am telling you is not simply a cultural history. It's a description of the story that shapes every single person that you know. This is why there is a rise in mental illness. It's absolutely concurrent with the disembedding of the individual because individuals can't constitute themselves by the very nature of the case. Subjectivity cannot sustain its own weight. We need others to tell us. But we've been given an ethical mandate by the Enlightenment that tells us that that's immoral, that nobody should constrain us. All right, well, we are back for another episode of Dust Bowl Diatribes. And for this episode, we're interviewing uh, Lincoln Rice, who is the author of the definitive collection of the Easy Essays, or the, the editor. Uh, Warren was the author, as well as Healing the Racial Divide, which is a book about the history of um, or a biography on Arthur Falls, who was an early black Catholic worker and the uh, theological implications to be drawn from his work. Um, I guess that's my introduction. Is there anything you would add to that or tell us about yourself? Sure. So, yeah, I've been part of the uh, Casa Maria Catholic worker in Milwaukee since 1998 and uh, in 2013, uh, earned my PhD in Christian ethics at Marquette University. And then I uh, kind of hot off the presses, a book that just came out that I uh, wrote is The Ethics of Protection, Reimagining Child Welfare in an Anti-Black Society. And that book really came out of the work that our Catholic worker in Milwaukee does where we um, we have four houses, kind of old Victorian houses, and two of those are dedicated to providing space for uh, parents who have open child protective services cases. And one of our workers, Amada Morales, actually spends most of her week in children's court providing support for families. So it's just a little bit more background about myself and the Catholic worker I'm associated with. Cool. Well, and that's probably a good segue to like, uh the discussion of your anti-racist work and uh how you see that fitting in with catholic workerhood yeah so it's um i i guess as a preface i got involved or at least for me anti-racism work came to the fore probably because of arthur falls the focus of uh, my first book healing the racial divide he was a black physician who started the first Catholic worker in Chicago in 1936. And when I came to the Catholic worker in 1998, uh, my room that I moved into, oddly enough, was kind of a repository for books, uh, which was wonderful. And one of them had an article that mentioned Arthur Falls. And I was very intrigued by his um his Catholic worker that he started because it wasn't a house of hospitality. He was more intrigued by Peter Morin's idea of a Catholic worker school. And he started a Catholic worker school and uh, was actually more opposed to doing um, hospitality because the school was a, also an action oriented school. They had different committees that researched different topics and possible courses of action to address different justice issues and then they would have weekly roundtables where each group would take turns and there might be some course of action. So 
I knew a little bit about that, but ended up um, trying to find out more about Falls and in the process came across his um, his niece who's passed away now, but um, she this was probably around 2011. At that point, she was in her 80s living in Kalamazoo, Michigan and had a 600 page rough draft memoir that he had wrote sitting in her suitcase in the basement. <laughs> so it ended up being a great source of what he brought, I think, to the early Catholic worker, though the early Catholic worker was definitely concerned about racial justice issues. Uh, the first issue has, I think, maybe even multiple articles that start on the first page that are addressing um, different either, you know, black workers who are maybe facing an issue um, either within that issue or a issue in the very near future that I know they would cover if there had been a lynching and where lynching legislation was. And it was a huge topic in the first few years of the worker. And I feel like that got a little bit put to the side, let's say, especially um, with the onset of World War II, where I think the Catholic worker was definitely on the defensive because of its pacifist stance and dug itself more in that aspect of itself. And, and I think that hurt kind of the broader vision that the Catholic worker had for society, because then in its later writings, races rarely mentioned um, in its role in poverty or war and, or other social justice issues seems to be neglected. It seems to be brought up perhaps as needed if, you know, probably post-World War II, the issue of the New York worker where race came to prominence was the issue following the death of Martin Luther King Jr. But all that to say, I feel like the, the last 10 years or so, uh, I think I, I'm part of a, a group of Catholic workers that have realized this is something that's been neglected in our tradition. It goes back to our roots, but it's not something that's been really emphasized. And I think even uh, Dorothy, it was something that was missing in much of her thought, um, you know, race barely comes up as an issue in the long loneliness. And similarly in her 1960s book, um, uh, uh, forgetting the name of it offhand. Um, but she wrote kind of a, you might call it a sequel to the long loneliness that talked about the early history of the Catholic worker through the present and kind of her journey there. Um, and Oddly enough, there was going to be a chapter on race. Uh, the editors didn't want it in the book, and um, she agreed, she allowed them to do it. They took it out of the book. Uh, but there were other sections that they also wanted her to remove, and she refused. So I think just to you know put things in perspective, I don't. And I'm not trying to say Dorothy Day was racist or Dorothy Day. You know, I think Dorothy Day definitely. Um, definitely was sympathetic and you know did work on behalf of um those working for racial justice but to me that example with uh her 19 early 1960s book on the catholic worker where she allowed the racism chapter to be excised but not other parts of it speaks to how where it fell on the hierarchy of importance oh. Yeah. Was it loaves and fishes? Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Loaves and fishes. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I think especially with um, black men who were being murdered either by police or over vigilant uh, people watching over their own neighborhoods, uh, there have been many in the Catholic worker in the last 10, 15 years that have become very interested in this issue and, uh, and so I've been very pleased that when I happened to publish the book on Arthur Falls, there seemed to be an audience among the Catholic worker, uh, among Catholic worker folks for it. And um, 
And oddly enough, I was giving a talk on Arthur Falls last night in Chicago, and to advertise the talk, the group there had borrowed a woodcut that Sarah Fuller had uh, from who had been previously part of the Los Angeles Catholic Worker. She had created a woodcut of Arthur Falls. So, and it's a woodcut of him that has his name and title, and then a quote from him that he would often tell groups if they were perhaps despairing that nothing seems to work or to help, he would let them know that, quote, if you're right, you don't always lose, unquote. So if you're right, you don't always lose. And he really took that from his own experience because he was involved with the Chicago Urban League, then the Catholic Worker Movement. He helped to integrate the hospital system in Chicago, um, among many other things. And, you know, some of the things that he worked on he achieved something other times he was unsuccessful and other times he at least prevented the loss of uh, you know prevented the loss of any current ground on the issue but he i think the part of his work that influences me in particular is focusing on a local issue and something with other people of goodwill and seeing what can be accomplished with the gifts and talents of those involved and so that's where kind of coming full circle to the book on child protective services that's become something we've focused on here because it's a issue that we've got to that we've learned about over the years and been able to be a resource for um for many of the families that have stayed with us who have had interactions with child protective services and of course there's a as one would probably expect an increased, not only interaction of black families with child protective services, but as you see with lots of other problems of with racial di disproportionality in the United States, um, it's been true for us and it's true across the board that um, black families are three to four times more likely to lose their children. So it's kind of We've seen that in practice. It got us into the issue, and now we're trying to, you know, work on that issue with uh, local people who are in different walks of life. And it's something that I feel would be similar to how Arthur Falls would have addressed an issue locally. Yeah, and like in the biographical section of it, you very much go through like he had these phases, one of which was kind of his Catholic worker phase, mm -hmm. and then he just kind of moved on to like where he thought there were opportunities either to learn more or to be to be a more effective activist, um, is at least how I read your book. Um, and I guess there's two sections I'd especially like to talk about. One would be um, you suggest in there that he had a somewhat strange, strained relationship with Dorothy because he wasn't doing enough hospitality. Um, but also he was like her surgeon at one point in her life. And um, I guess, could you expand on that a bit? Yeah, so they had, they definitely disagreed at times, but it didn't, I, I don't think it affected the respect that they had for one another, even though they disagreed in their visions for the Catholic worker. Uh, which I guess feels strange to say, because one of them, of course, is the founder, you know, a founder of the Catholic worker. <laughs> but I think that shows how the 30s was this era that, you know, I think a lot of people weren't necessarily af afraid, or especially him as someone who was probably born just a, um, he was born four years after Dorothy, so kind of a contemporary of Dorothy, who was a physician and uh, but yeah, he, she definitely disagreed with him and not opening a house of hospitality. And one of the times that she visited on her, when she was leaving town, she had uh, two of the young white impressionable <laughs> Catholic worker men bring her to the bus station. And before she boarded the bus, she gave them a key. And then she let them know that she had obtained this key from a priest and that she had obtained an apartment for where they could start doing hospitality. <laughs> so instead of, you know, bringing this up or the key or, you know, she'd been in Milwaukee visiting with the Catholic worker, she had plenty of opportunities to broach it with the whole community. Uh, but kind of, I'd say, a little back door wheeling and dealing. And, okay. and I think 
the, these young men were interested in a ca- uh, house of hospitality also they didn't end up using the apartment that dorothy had obtained it was not a good it wasn't a workable situation but they did then create their own separate catholic worker but they stayed in touch with uh arthur falls and he wasn't one to hold grudges so he respected that they wanted to branch out and do something different um but it was right around that time period also that dorothy came was passing through chicago and she had a infection with an abscess in her throat and she went to a catholic hospital that at the time would advertise itself in local catholic newspapers as a hospital for mothers of the white race so it was mainly a maternity hospital and that's where she went i don't know why she chose that hospital maybe it was the nearest one and they needed to do surgery and arthur falls was a surgeon and she said well i have a surgeon here and they said that's fine have him come over and then when the sisters saw that the surgeon was black <laughs> uh they're like well he can't operate on you and dorothy said well then i won't be operated on and i get the sense this was very serious and she could possibly die and the hospital didn't want to be known as the hospital that dorothy day died at <laughs> so they relented but on their paperwork even though it was arthur falls who performed the surgery according to their paperwork he was the assisted he he was the assistant physician because they wanted to at least in their paperwork say well it was led by a white physician even though that wasn't the truth of the matter gotcha well and partly where that stuck out to me is like in my readings of of day and then just Catholic worker history, I guess I've always, I've taken away the idea that she herself was somewhat ambivalent about houses of hospitality. And insofar as she saw them as sort of a stopgap measure Mm. to how a a true, you know, distributivist Catholic, whatever society should be. So it was a little surprising that she would be kind of passive aggressive about it (laughs) to me. But, um, Obviously, you've read more of this. Uh, am I wrong to have been somewhat surprised? Um, I think, hmm, that's a good question. I mean, I do think she felt the heart of the Catholic worker, at least at that time, and perhaps her feelings may have adjusted over the years. Uh, but I think the hospitality she viewed as a core aspect to it. Um, I mean, especially after they'd been, you know, during the first year, you know, she had started the paper, and, but no house, you know, I think their expectation initially was that bishops or some others in the church would start these houses of hospitality, and they didn't. And so in December, during that very cold December, of 1933 in New York, you know, she begged and borrowed all the money she could and took some money that was supposed to be for the next printing of the newspaper and opened a house of hospitality. Uh, so I I think, especially maybe after taking that on as a personal <laughs> uh, campaign or um, project, she wanted that to become perhaps the mainstay. And I think you see even early on when um, the first farms were started, they they feel like they also need to do hospitality, which when you add in the fact that they're usually buying whatever they can afford, which means the farmland usually isn't that good. Many of them aren't farmers and don't know what they're doing. And they're trying to do hospitality because they feel like that's part of the essence of the Catholic worker, or perhaps a part that they can't let go even if they're on the land. Uh, I think that led to the downfall of most of those early Catholic worker farms and farming communes. Mm -hmm. Hi, Lincoln. I just wanted to interject, like, just to make sure I understand, because I I unfortunately kind of got into the the middle of the conversation. Are are you saying that um, Morin um, was was more for the farms and Dorothy was more for the houses of hospitality. Of course, they wanted there to be hospitality in both places, but is that kind of the breakdown? Um, I don't know if I'd state it exactly that way. I just, especially early on, I think Dorothy felt the hospitality should be part of 
any project the Catholic worker is doing, whether it's on the land or not. Um, and for Peter, it was definitely all, you know, his three point program of the green revolution was round table discussions, uh, houses of hospitality and the farming communes. So for him, they were also integral, but I think he viewed them as separate things, perhaps more than Dorothy did, but I don't know if he would have rated one above the other. I know uh, with the ex with the great growth of houses of hospitality and kind of a, perhaps one might say a neglect of the emphasis on the farming communes, he definitely felt there should be more emphasis and more of their resources dedicated to the farming communes. But I think for both of them, it was always just trying to find the right balance. I mean, for Dorothy, I think perhaps the, one of the strongest, and for those who might say, well, she always lived mostly in the city at Houses of Hospitality, but at the same time, obviously, her whole vision of the Catholic worker rubbed off on her daughter because her daughter mostly lived on the land. <laughs> so, you know, there's, so I think the, they were always important, but it was always what's the proper balance. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and then that, where that bears on Arthur Falls as well is what do you do when he's doing kind of, I mean, this is kind of anachronistic terms, but when he's sort of doing anti-racist uh, grassroots organizing, you know, that isn't clearly in either of those three programs. So I could see how it could be a little, a little disjunct. And yeah, then... he's, he's definitely marrying the first aspect of the program with his previous experience with the Chicago Urban League, because it was definitely a, a model type that they would have used, but he was then injecting it with certain Catholic worker beliefs. I, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think he was ever interested in the farming aspect of the Catholic worker. Uh, but he was very taken by the cooperative vision. And uh, that first Catholic worker, it wasn't solely a storefront that had roundtable discussions. It actually was, he also started their um, a credit union. So actually, and I'm not sure how many early Catholic workers actually started their own credit unions, <laughs> but, but he did. And then later on, um, because especially black residents in Chicago had difficulty uh, and probably similar to today, when you think about it in large cities, there's often these food deserts <laughs> where, if, you know, you have difficulty finding access to quality food at a reasonable price, unless you're going to be going to corner stores where usually there is not good quality food at a reasonable price. And so later on, he also helped found uh, a grocery consumer owned co-op in Chicago also. So that, you know, the co-op aspect of the Catholic worker movement was definitely um something that he held on to yeah he very much reads as you know what we would now call like a kind of centrist liberal like he believed in like uh, he, this is me kind of summarizing how you present it but you know when you connect it all he like believed in like uh enlightenment values objective truth the scientific method uh, especially the social sciences mm -hmm. you talk about that a lot um yeah. And so uh, he believed in, you know, integration and cooperation. Um, and then the, the other thing I wanted to make sure we talked about, and it, it flows into this, that he was didn't seem to be very interested in civil rights and especially uh, black power, black nationalism in the 60s, 70s. Um, could you talk a bit about that? Sure. I mean, I think um, he would have been more critical of the black power movement. He would have been supportive of the civil rights movement, but he wasn't active i mean he wasn't active with many of the current civil right the his contemporary civil rights activities that were happening around him you know for instance during that same time period that kind of what we think of as perhaps the heyday of the civil rights movement in the late 50s early 60s you know he's working with a, a group of white and black doctors in chicago to make sure that black candidates who want to be doctors can get into medical school. And then if they actually become a doctor, can they actually be at a hospital? Uh, except at that point, there were about 70 different hospital corporations in the Chicago area, and only three of them would hire black doctors, which also then, of course, limited quality health care for black uh, residents in Chicago. Um, you know, so along while well, 
so from a civil rights perspective, he then was um, with the black doctors of that group suing almost every hospital, 70 plus hospitals uh, in the Chicago area and was successful then in obtaining uh, access <laughs> for black doctors and then hence their patients. And this was kind of concurrent with the civil rights movement. Um, but he... Oddly enough, I think his court case, and of course, that'd be something that would make him very different from kind of the more core aspects of the Catholic worker. He's not an anarchist. Um, mm -hmm. And so he he definitely views the courts as a legitimate method to for change. And his court case probably would have been um, followed and others would have used it, except they, they came to their agreement with the hospital system in, with these different hospital corporations in February of 1964. And it was a few months later in the summer that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed, which then you know, essentially made what the hospitals were doing illegal. <laughs> so it, it hid that court case then essentially became not necessary from a legal perspective. Uh, when it came to the Black Power movements, um, I think you know, to use one example, um, th one of the pushes during that time period, which we still see arguments about today, is use the use of history regarding, you know, Africa, African-American history, which is, you know, I don't remember ever learning anything about Africa or African-American history in my high school in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It was still neglected. And, you know, so that was one aspect of needing this type of history to be preserved. And um, he wasn't against that, but he didn't want it to be the main focus. Yeah, I mean, he himself in the 30s had worked with the Chicago Urban League to make sure that the Chicago's World Fair had a replica cabin of Jean-Baptiste du Sable, who was the first western settler in chicago he was largely being ignored because he happened to be black <laughs> he was also a black catholic uh, so arthur falls always liked to quip that the first white man to settle in chicago was a black catholic um <laughs> you know so that's so he did value that but during the late 60s as he had now kind of opened paths pathways for African Americans to go into medicine in Chicago and work at hospitals. He now knew that the the school system in Chicago wasn't, especially those who were poor, whether white or black, but usually in more predominantly black high schools, um, the education system was failing them and they weren't uh, competent enough in math and science to get into these medical schools. So he started a program um, where on the weekends, kids would get kind of paid, um, paid to come to class if they were interested in going to the medical field. And he and some others would catch them up on what their schools weren't doing in math and science. So he, I think he always wanted to come from a real practical standpoint, like, well, you know, this isn't necessarily a bad idea, but what will it actually accomplish in you know, opening doors and opportunities for people. Was there yeah. a clash between the him and and his friends in the Catholic work, worker movement over his particular um, concerns and style, or was that okay? Oddly enough, I'd say that his way of going about things, I feel, left a more indelible mark on the this early group of white Catholic workers, then Dorothy and Peter left on them. You know, for example, um, Ed Marciniak, who's a well-known lay Catholic in the Chicago area, uh, who passed away a few years ago now. Uh, but he he was one of these, you know, young um, white Catholics who came and was surprised to show up to a Catholic worker gathering uh, and see that the person who seemed in charge was a black man. And throughout then his later life, uh, well, I'll in the 40s, for instance, um, 
Arthur Falls had been um, had been badgering Cardinal Stritch to, on the archdiocesan level, create an interracial council that would address the racism that Catholics that Black Catholics were facing in their own churches. And Stritch was a Southerner who always pushed against it. But in the 40s, he finally relented, formed such a group. He made sure Falls was not on that council. <laughs> but Ed Marciniak worked his way on there because he wanted to make sure that this issue would move forward. And later on in the 1960s, early 1960s, when Falls was working to uh, desegregate the hospital system, at that point, Ed Marciniak was working for the city of Chicago. Actually, he was the executive director of um, what they called human relations for the city of Chicago, their department of human relations, which was their term for race relations at the time. And so he was working from the city end of, uh, and they were in contact during this time and both working on this issue together, but from different angles. So I'd say that that's actually quite common with many of these people um, that were involved with him. And the Catholic worker also brought to in Chicago, brought a lot of seminarians who were interested in social justice at the time to the Catholic worker where he was. And it essentially created a generation of Catholic priests in Chicago who were interested in urban ministry and race issues who then had an influence on race issues in Chicago during the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So it's um, for Chicago history, he's, a, I believe, a pretty important figure when it comes to Catholic racial justice. And so uh, could you kind of bridge the gap between um him and the Catholic worker movement uh, that most people associate of, you know, like protesting Vietnam. Um, can you jump us from there to like uh, you and uh, the, the, the anti-racist debate that's happened in the last decade within the Catholic worker movement? Yeah. So I think obviously much of the protest work of the Catholic worker movement uh, I mean, there was protesting during the 30s. Uh, you know, they might be ha having, some, it usually wasn't the type of protesting that would be risking arrest, but there might be signs that were being held outside of some consulate or, you know, and Arthur Falls also inspired by this, but by his own kind of black heritage, um, they would be pushing the envelope. They They were in the 30s, um, their interracial Catholic group might do a sit-in at a local restaurant downtown that wouldn't serve Black customers. But essentially, with their large group of white and Black customers coming in there, it would then prevent anyone else from being able to sit in and order food. <laughs> and it was their way of pressuring them to uh, start serving Black customers. So there's you know, some some I'm not aware of the New York worker or other Catholic workers doing actions like this. It usually is more of protesting with a sign. Obviously, Eamon Hennessy, I think, is largely influential and in perhaps of bringing in the notion of regularly risking arrest, usually for more of a peace related issue or anti-war issue. Um, I think those of us who have been interested in the uh, anti-racism work over the last 10 plus years or so there's perhaps been maybe a little bit of a de-emphasis on the anti-war focus uh, I, i'm not aware of any of us being to the best of my knowledge most of us are still pacifists and still are anti-war but it's more that we've uh feel, or at least I'll speak for myself, I feel that during my first, you know, 15 years as a Catholic worker, I was neglecting the issue of racial justice. And so um, that, and kind of, I'll say being influenced by people like Arthur Falls, noting that perhaps when I've been looking at peace issues, early on, I was regularly arrested in the late 90s in the first decade of the two of the 2000s probably almost every year at the irs office um or at you know at a naval base in northern wisconsin i was arrested usually at least once a year um but as i got more involved and interested in race issues 
Um, I didn't necessarily see that getting arrested was the best way to address the issue. Um, that could change depending on, I'm not saying I'm opposed to getting arrested. It's just, it, in every instance, it doesn't always seem to be the right answer where beforehand it always seemed to be the right answer for me. Um, so, you know, now taking the issue of child protective services, it might mean meeting with judges and lawyers and state representatives, which still feels very strange to do as a Catholic worker. Cause yeah, unlike falls, I'm, I would still consider myself an anarchist. So I'm not meeting with these judges or legislators because I believe that the state is the answer. It's more to try to, uh, similar to what we've seen with the uh, prison abolition movement, that you know some of them will also work on changing certain laws if they believe those laws are leading to the deconstruction of that system and so i'd take a similar line there that that's what we've that's how we've worked with the state system here in milwaukee with the cps issue it's not to validate the state but to try to remove its influence where we see it doing the most harm and and we see that kind of regularly at our house of hospitality because that's where that's how I got involved in it in the first place when child protective services started removing the children of families who are staying with us. I mean that that sounds practical and I I think you have to deal with the situation as it is, right? And work within the constraints that you have. Um, I think it's occurred to Spencer and I both that like the as far as the war protesting goes, it's, you know, the um, the war machine and the military industrial complex is so huge. And so, um, you know, the idea that we could influence government in this in this particular issue seems so remote of a possibility that turning your attention to other issues that you might be able to have some impact on seems like a, a practical and useful thing to do. And I totally, you know, I, I don't blame you at all for talking to officials and doing whatever um, work you can within the system, not because the system's great, but because that's what currently is. And if you don't do that, you're not doing your due diligence probably. <laughs> And for instance, if I told a mother who's just been contacted by CPS, well, don't give any power to the state, don't cooperate at all, depending on her situation, that could just lead to her kids being taken away or her being put in jail. Like it wouldn't, it's, it's one of those things, I think, kind of the tradition, in, me, in many strands of anarchism, US anarchism, it comes out of a position of white privilege where someone can disengage from interacting with the state and it doesn't have any effect on them. But when the state is actively attacking your family, <laughs> it's hard to, essentially impossible to disengage. Right. And it holds all the resources, all the power and all the resources. So you can't ignore that. Um and so, you know, I mean, to be uh, to be whatever anarchism means, you know, because it's a fluid concept too. to like sort of embrace that philosophically is different from um, dealing with the practical realities of life. So, I mean, I, I respect that position. I think a lot of people get uncomfortable because they think that these things are somehow compromises. But mm -hmm. this is like what it takes to be effective in the real world, it seems to me. So, yeah, like I know Spencer was asking a little bit about, you know, the um, I guess we were heading in that direction when I kind of derailed us, like the controversies involved in this, um, like the the debate about anti-racism. Um, um, we do want to have your thoughts about that. Sure. I mean, there there definitely is two minds of this in the Catholic worker. I, I think. I don't think there's much debate in the Catholic worker that the United States is a country where racism exists and there's a lot of work to do where it's become controversial in among some Catholic workers and even within certain Catholic worker communities is the notion um, 
would it be fair to label Dorothy Day and Peter Morin as anti-racist? And I would come on the side and say they were not anti-racist. I would say they weren't um, they weren't for racism. I, I would put them more uh, a term that kind of a middle term that's been created is racial liberalism, where it's there's this notion to address those gross wrongs, but perhaps not seeing how accurately how racism has kind of inserted itself into almost every issue, every justice issue in the United States. You know, if, for example, I don't think we can talk about poverty or jails or almost any justice issue in the United States without mentioning race. If race isn't brought up, then I think we're probably misunderstanding the issue. And I, I'd say that's where, you know, during my first 10, 15 years in the worker movement, if when I was mainly reading Catholic worker sources and not too many black sources, uh, I, I feel like it affected my understanding of the reality of injustice in the United States. Uh, I really needed to have that complement of understanding how racism is a part of our fabric of um, when it comes to housing, medicine, jails, poverty, just every aspect of society. Um, and I think even within communities, then I am know of many communities where with that, not, it's not like some members were saying, Hey, you're racist is more that they wanted to have internal discussions about how can we make sure that we are conscious of how we might have certain unconscious biases um, towards black individuals or Hispanic individuals. And to make sure as a community, we're more thoughtful in how we're addressing the issues and how it, race interacts. And I th those deep conversations that have happened in some communities have led to some very difficult conversations or conversations that have stopped or people leaving communities or, um, because I think there's this there's this thought on among some which I would not be a part of that would view Dorothy Day and Peter Morin as essentially perfect on the issue of race, uh, and that the Catholic Worker Movement I'd say they treat it more as if the Catholic Worker Movement were the kingdom of God instead of just an instrument towards working towards the kingdom of God. Uh, it's not a heavenly reality. It's just, a, I think, a good plan and blueprint put down by Peter Morin to to work up towards a better reality. Sure. Well, and I, I don't understand how, I don't know, maybe I was just too agnostic for large parts of my life, but whenever you're starting from some principle that the founders of our our movement or quasi-religious congregation or whatever we are, um, they didn't have feet of clay. Like that already seems, you know, before we get into the data that people should already be on guard against that type of thinking. Um, and and maybe it is, it, maybe it's just too complicated to say that can be true about more in a day, but also they were still good people and they left us mm -hmm. alone. That's important. Um, I don't know. Is that in your experience, is that just too complicated of a thought? <laughs> For, um, uh, hopefully not. But I mean, I, I will I will say that I think among white Catholics, Dorothy Day and Peter Morin were almost as good as you could get during the 30s, 40s, 50s and 60s. Uh, but I think it was also true that Dorothy wasn't reading black authors. Um, I think she started to in the 60s and it's interesting to look at her writings in the newspaper columns from in the early 60s. She's critical of the civil rights movement with their or critical of the aspect of the civil rights movement that's focusing on court cases and changing laws. Um, but then as the decade continues, she it's clear that where in the early 60s, she thought that perhaps by doing things like creating co-ops or kind of other internal mechanisms, the black community in the United States could negate some of the aspects of racism and flourish. 
by the end of the 60s, I think she saw that she didn't necessarily think that civil, you know, working in the courts was the way to go, but she saw that what the Catholic worker was doing wasn't necessarily solving these problems either. She kind of, there's some articles during that time period in the late 60s, early 70s, where I read her as almost despairing the issue. It doesn't seem like there's any way forward. Um, mm. I mean, this is on my mind, you know, as I'm listening to the history of the, you know, that we still, as, as a movement, seem to be largely white. Mm -hmm. And there does seem to be, regardless of the intentions, which probably are pretty neutral, there just seems to be some sort of barrier where um, in, in a lot of places, the races just are not mixing, cooperating. Um, and so, it, you know, you could characterize as a still sort of white dominated movement that isn't, where that's not at all intentional, I would say, you know, in fact, the opposite, probably, but where, for whatever reason, just like you see with a lot of churches that are almost completely white, and then we have churches over here that are black, and so forth, we don't seem to be able to, like, take our good intentions and actually find a way to, like, mix and cooperate together. And so I definitely want your thoughts about that. Like, why is that still so? And what could we do about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th um, I think part, I mean, part of it's a historical notion that the Catholic worker movement is still mostly a Catholic movement. And, you know, we've seen a drop over the last century of the population of black Catholics. The Catholic Church has not been hospitable. <laughs> it, it wasn't during the days of Arthur Falls. And I'd say largely today, it's it's still not. I've been involved with uh, parishes here in the city of Milwaukee that, you know, were suffering in membership because they were white parishes where they have members either dying or white flight or, you know, but there's a... Uh, even though I wouldn't say they were overtly racist, <laughs> they feared actually trying to open up their churches to the people that actually make up their neighborhoods now. Um, and so, it, you know, if someone from the neighborhood goes, goes into many of these mainly white Catholic churches, not just in Milwaukee, but in many places around the country, you're going to have a very European style of worship, uh, race is probably rarely mentioned uh you know so it's these i think that's one aspect that the catholic worker usually attracts catholics but if there aren't if the number of black catholics continues to decline that's gonna mm -hmm. shrink that pool of candidates um and i know that one reason when i first came to the milwaukee catholic worker almost everyone was catholic um I think that that's been one of the changes that I've probably played a role in myself is uh, I don't think there was ever a thought that you had to be Catholic to join the community, but it was more of the culture of the community. And over the years, because we wanted to be a space where, you know, since most of the workers when I first came were white, almost all of them, and most of the families who stay with us are African-American, um, is there were different um, African-Americans that were interested in joining our community, even if they weren't Catholic or in some cases not religious, we decided to, you know, well, let's see how it works and uh, put them kind of through the same process for, and we have a six month process for joining the community, a six month kind of probation, if you want to call it period. And um, I found that that kind of enriched our discussions as a community It enriched how um, it enriched our communal life, but it also added an aspect where now many of the families who stay there just don't see white workers. Our community, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's probably like 40% black, um, which is probably, I think, a greater number 
or percentage than most Catholic worker communities. And I think it's benefited our house and um, allowed for at times open and more honest conversations among the work, um, among the family staying with us. And, and I think I say that that's more, I should say, our, our point out that our community is, does more short-term hospitality for families. Um, I think there can be a difference, you know, some communities do long-term hospitality, some for families, but for, you know, for single individuals and there's longer term hospitality, it allows a greater period of time for people to know each other. In our situation with doing families, families usually stay with us for two to three months. So it's not, there aren't necessarily close relationships being created, but when you have workers that might look more like some of the families who are staying with us, it allows for, um, kind of a fa uh, easier to build trust at the initial level and to have more open conversations more immediately. So you found it helpful there. So what would you, what do you say to people who say um, all of this talk about race is good and very important, but there's this uh, at least as big of an issue and maybe more big issue called like class. Oh. And what do you say to those I must admit, I thought you were going to say climate. <laughs> well, and that, that's another big one. Um, but, but, uh, but yeah, and like a, a voice that I found pretty influential on this would be Adolf Reed Jr. And um, I think to some degree, it also, you could, I think that's probably underlying the tension between Dorothy Day and Peter Moore and um, especially Day. Like there was this old left idea that was more common that yes, race is important, but uh, class is how we're going to unite people. Um, I, yeah. How would you respond to that? And I guess respond to climate too. <laughs> um, but yeah, with class, I do think Dorothy is coming out of that. And I think, you know, her previous knowledge and interactions with communists and socialists who, you know, were, I mean, communists were some of the, as a group or especially white and those who are white communists reply some of the most dedicated anti racial you know, to, yeah, you write about how some of the most active on the race issue in the United States during the thirties and forties. Uh, but write about, oh, just real quick, you write about in the spoke about how falls didn't like communist ideology, but he saw them as kind of like the gold standard of integrated activism. He knew Sorry. that he, he believed. Yeah, exactly. He believed that if he was living in Russia, life would be better for him. Uh, he didn't view the Russian system as the way to be, but he knew they were they were actually interested in the race issue where the United States and most white Americans were not. Um, but yeah, with class, I think. But nonetheless, even with all of that said, class was definitely viewed as the primary issue for many of them that if you could solve the class issue everything else would sort of fall into place and i think dorothy on some implicit le level was influenced by that and i think it led to her neglect for most of her life of realizing how insidious the race issue was um but I, yeah i think for those who would say well we just need to work on class um I think it's, you know, it, uh, one example that comes to mind is uh, part, probably because it was definitely formative for me. It was something I remember in the news, even as a child uh, during the uh, and in high school and going into college, the late 80s and the early 90s, where we have this notion of the welfare queen, um, you know, even though the majority of poor people in the United States are white it disproportionately, you know, poverty affects people of color and um, black Americans in particular. Uh, but it was, you know, in order to, to a greater level, defund welfare um, in the United States, politicians needed to paint the typical welfare recipient as black. And so it's, it's definitely um, if the the reason that welfare exists in the first place, when it was started as a system in the 30s, uh, it was started because people, uh, politicians were moved to at least to some extent 
by the poverty of white mothers and mothers who had to give up their children in order to work and support themselves. And so they wanted to make sure that mothers who, you know, whether the father had left or died or whatever the case was, they wanted to make sure to preserve those white families. Um, and the only reason that welfare got passed in the United States at that time, it's somewhat similar to what we saw later on in the 30s with um, uh, Social Security. It was because of a compromise with um, Southern states that welfare would be arranged in such a format that they could deny it to Black families. And similar to Social Security later on, it was passed because they made sure that certain groups like farm workers and housekeepers wouldn't be included in social security which you know during the 30s most farm workers in the united states were black <laughs> so they they wanted to you know they wouldn't have been able to pass that legislation um and even though i don't want to get too caught up in legislation but i think it does to some extent then reflect the values of the people in this country on this land and that they can feel for white people suffering but if they see black people benefiting from these same aspects then it seems more of like well maybe they're cheating the system maybe we need to be more um more critical of how we're giving out these funds uh so i to me, that's maybe the primary example to show how these issues you can't if you're only talking about class, you're you're going to have a blind eye to any legislation or any acts of people that are trying to address issues of poverty. So you almost view it more as like a like a screen that if you don't have this framework you're more likely to to i guess complete that thought if i'm on the right track you're you're more likely to um be blinded to real issues of poverty and injustice because the storyline you know of the late 80s and early 90s is the welfare queen is this black mother that's just sitting at home collecting her checks maybe even going to college and i of course now I think, well, why would it be bad if she went to college? <laughs> why do we need to, you know, no one cared if the white mothers during the 60s, 70s and 80s were going to college. But if a black mother was using this money to go to college, then all of a sudden this was an issue. So there's this double standard that seems to cause a visceral reaction if if we associate it with black recipients. And so I think that the anti-racism work a large part of it is trying to acknowledge this double standard in our culture uh, and it's only after we acknowledge that double standard that then we can really say well how do we want to address issues of poverty so that everyone um, has access to the resources and can be a part of the universal destination of goods etc yeah, like what I'm hearing is that racism is a pretty useful foil to like in the shell game to get white people to focus on black people rather than on the way in which, um, you know, the government operates, the economy operates and so on. Then, then they can focus on, we just need to get rid of this, you know, the welfare fraud perpetrated mm -hmm. by, you know, these people over here. And meanwhile, that the entire problem doesn't get solved. And yeah, that I think that um, that seems reasonable. And it's why you can't totally extricate those two, racism and class. You, race and class can't be, because race is so constantly used in this country to, um, divert people's attention away from, you know, what we really ought to get done. But then it, it seems to me it cuts both ways as well. So like it can be demagogued um, in, in the way that Lincoln is talking about, but it also seems like, I guess to me, a, a counter example of how it can be used another way is um, when people like, not that, I mean, I wasn't really a Bernie supporter because I don't believe in... <laughs> any of these actually existing politicians. But uh, when people like Ta-Nehisi Coates came out and said, well, Bernie's not very good on the reparation question, 
even though Bernie's talking about uh, giving people better jobs, better wages, access to uh, potentially like better health care. The idea that um, all of that is like insufficiently anti-racist, even though like by definition, if most BIPOC people are are poor, then they would benefit, you know, assuming there aren't, you know, like what you talked about with social security exclusions. Um, if, if these policies weren't actively racist or neutrally racist, um, it just seems to me like the, the flip side of it is if you don't have a class screen, then the race stuff can be demagogued to basically say middle class and upper class black people should get preferential treatment and we're going to ignore poor white people because that's going to be coded as insufficiently not racist. Um, I guess, what do you say? If I'm wrapped in darkness, please. <laughs> I mean, I, I think there's two issues there. One, you know, Coates is, I must admit, I'm not an expert on Coates's politics. <laughs> uh, no, um, so, you know, obviously there are disagreements among different black groups and individuals if, you know, should there be more emphasis uh, or critique against Republicans, or should the critique be with Democratic? I mean, I think there's often a view of when you have an open Democratic race for president, you want to make sure that race is on their platform. And so you're going to, you know, you don't, you don't believe you're going to get race on the platform of the Republican Party, <laughs> but you might make a little headway, maybe with the Democrats. So I'm assuming it has something to do with, you know, it was an election year. They're trying to get it on to the, you know, get it on the agenda of the for when he and Hillary were having their debates. Um, but when it comes to if, you know, if you're neglecting class and focusing perhaps more solely on race, um, you know, will that then leave poor white people in the lurch? And I get just to go back and the to the pure poor black people too. Um, yeah, but I mean, that's uh, if I go back to the example of let's say welfare, um, if when welfare was cut in the 90s. It, I mean, I believe it was cut because people viewed it as then defunding the welfare queen, but really it was defunding mostly white people, white, poor people. And so if the race issue could be brought to the fore to realize the racism inherent in that policy and allow, a, you know, whether it's welfare or some other action or program to address poverty. Um, so, I mean, I guess even when I'm speaking, I'm involving class in it because <laughs> if we want to address, like they go hand in hand, but if uh, when welfare is more open, uh, it's going to obviously also help many poor white people uh, with the child protective services issue, even though it disproportionately affects black people, more black people have their children removed and are you know affected by the system. But any change that would um, bring back that harm, ameliorate that harm will also just by definition help white people, white poor families also, you know, for example, it oddly enough, even the rate of um, Black children is pretty, uh, the with the statistic that black children are three times more likely to be removed than white children, it doesn't seem to matter if some state is on the low end of removals or on the high end of removals, the disproportionality is a constant. So the state that at least is on the low end of removals is also removing far less white children. Uh, so at least when it comes, to, I feel like the issue of poverty and race kind of float and sink together. Um, when, when there's gains, uh, gains for African-Americans, I do think it's in most cases also a gain for whites. I think a similar argument could be made. People that work in disability ethics kind of make a similar argument. Again, it's not, you could find ex very specific examples where this isn't the case, but generally speaking, um, 
when you have greater accessibility for people with, let's just say, certain physical handicaps, like if they're in a wheelchair, um, you know, for instance, having curbs that now have uh, a ramp to get up of. I know when I was a kid <laughs> growing up in the early 80s, it was kind of when that transition was happening. I grew up on a corner house and it was a curb. If you had a wheelchair, you weren't getting up. You'd have to go around to the next uh, driveway and get up. But, you know, that access for the curb not only helps people who are in wheelchairs, but older people who might be in walkers or people that just have a hard time walking, period. You know, it's when you've increased that access for a certain population, it often then increases access for others. I think maybe Spencer's got in mind, you know, that when we address race purely without any class consideration, what we sometimes get is just verb verbiage and and maybe some policies that apply mainly to professional people, but not to most people, you know, or that really deal most entirely in the realm of feelings or something like that. And that that also is kind of a smoke screen, you know, um, because those types of things do not affect even even affirmative action only affected a very small subsection of people uh, where God applied females as uh, African Americans and others because it just wasn't done. It wasn't um, there's no affirmative action for working class people almost. I mean, I think I can say that fairly definitively. So like, and in a lot of cases when it was implemented, it was implemented in a way that was very superficial to basically be symbolic. And, and that's where we tend to go if we don't, you know, keep squarely focused on those economic issues at the same time, I feel like. Yeah, I mean, I think there's always that danger, but it's uh, as long as we're aware of it. Um, I mean, I guess I feel like it's a possible danger, but at least in my work on anti-racism work, I haven't witnessed that problem. Um, I could see perhaps being more of an issue in politics. <laughs> um, you know, I know when I look at like city employment here in the city of Milwaukee, um, obviously as the city actively started hiring more people of color that affected working class people of color, um, when I look at those who are professionals, if I go down and walk, if I go down to the part of the city where it's all the engineers, they're still almost all white men. <laughs> if I go to the library, it's still almost all white women. Um, it's oddly, I think the emphasis or the news stories have often focused on the professional aspects of affirmative action. But I guess where I see the, the greatest gains in affirmative action, uh, it's in places of where the access is easier. You know, like for instance, Falls knew he had opened these doors for black doctors to enter the medical system, but there were still all these other barriers, like a proper education to even get into the doors of Northwestern. So, you know, um, I think in the professional world, it's probably still very difficult to get in. And there's just a very small minority <laughs> of people of color. Yeah, uh, you're right, from what I can tell. Um, I have one big question, but I don't know if Spencer, I, and we're kind of like running down um, on time, but like, did you have any other questions, Spencer, that you definitely wanted to get to? I mean, I, I definitely wanted to ask about uh, kind of my my theory through to the extent I've been in the Catholic worker in Kansas City, and obviously you are far more of an authority on this. But it almost seems to me like there's two kinds of uh, Catholic workers that I'm crudely calling Moronites and Tennesseeites. Um, and, and Moronites trying to be like Orthodox Catholics. And usually there's uh, this vision of what reconstructing a, a Christian social order should look like or long kind of distributist anarchistic lines. Um, and there are more what I'm calling Hennesseeites. Um, more Amon, named after Amon Hennessy. Um, even if they've, I'm not saying these people are directly inspired from him. Most of them have never read his stuff if they've even heard of him, but it is a more rad lib, uh, like they're radical liberals. They believe people should be free. 
Um, we should work together. We should raise our voice against oppression, protest injustice. Um, and uh, if we're too Catholic, actually, that's kind of weird and creepy and, and, and authoritarian. Um, do you think there's any truth to that? Or uh, again, if I'm wrapped in darkness? Um, I mean, I, I would say there's definitely uh, many. I mean, I, I feel like there are people that I could put into those groups. There's also folks. I mean, what you, when I I know I mentioned when I first came to the Milwaukee Catholic Worker, it was almost totally Catholic. But even at that point, I went. I would have said, well, there's a, and I probably at that point would have put myself with the Henia sites. <laughs> um, and there would have been a few others of us, but I'd say at, at least half, if not more than half of our workers, I don't know if they'd follow, follow too much in either of those. Like most of them are not interested in being arrested. Most of them are not interested in protests. Um, most of the folks who end up becoming part of our community at Casa Maria are more interested in the house of hospitality and the work that that includes. Um, maybe some of that is a notion of building a new Christian order, but it, I'd, I'd say they're more attracted to that work and the interactions. It's kind of some, I mean, Peter, I know in, in at least one of his essays on houses of hospitality noted that houses of hospitality are um, given opportunity for the rich to interact with the poor. And, you know, that is something that is important. And uh, I feel like more so today than in the 1930s, we are, segregated not only still by race but by class you know with the highway system and the growth of suburbs class and racial segregation are much much greater um than they were at that time and you can eventually you can essentially avoid interacting with poor people <laughs> if if you are already you know if you are not poor and you have the ability to afford a home and live in some suburb um you, you almost never have to interact with the poor except maybe they're begging your groceries but if you're keeping it in your own neighborhood the poor might not even have access to come out there and beg the groceries it might be high school kids in your area and um so maybe i'm getting off there but um they're definitely i, I can think of people who are both but i feel like there's the majority of catholic workers that i know are probably more moved by the work and the interactions and the relationships that are being built and are not as interested either from the Henia night perspective of the anti-war protesting or the Moronite perspective of um of the building a new social order um i mean i think there have been very few catholic workers over the over its entire history that have been necessarily moved by that which i'll you know if we which i'd I put more as the farming communes that i often refer to it as Morin's end game <laughs> the village economy that he was trying to move to it's very rare for me to meet catholic workers who actually are very interested in moving to a village economy um they're more interested in creating a new social order where by them I, for them i think the new social order would be more of um it might be anarchist it might not be but one where there's more relationship building which hopefully also leads to a decrease in um in inequality mm -hmm. uh, to me a lot uh, of it, it yeah. seems like the background is more like social democrat christian democrat there's something that that seems to be kind of their vague background. Yeah. And I don't know, the Orthodox, I mean, I don't know. I mean, Peter was, Peter and Dorothy were of a time period that, um, I mean, most Catholics didn't really question most church teachings. Um, and even Peter, you know, if he was around today, would he still 
believe would he still be against the use of birth control i don't know <laughs> obviously i i can't think of too many catholics in 1935 who are against the church's teaching on birth control um in one sense it was something so new that argument was in its infancy but he definitely disagreed um or i shouldn't say disagreed but he saw the core of the catholic faith and and its implications for society very differently than perhaps most bishops in the united states um you know so i don't know i always feel strange about orthodoxy i would have a more i want to hear that orthodox piety it it seems to me more narrow. I don't know if Peter would have it be so narrow. Um, but that's one of those things. It's uh, There's no definitive answer. We can argue about it after the fact. Sure. Yeah. And there's plenty of evidence, you know, like, uh, you know, there was definitely an ecumenical posture um, from him and from Dorothy um, that that was held in at least I read him as held in tension by being a pretty earnest, uh, pretty earnestly trying to like be within the the confines of orthodoxy at that time, um, yeah. which doesn't nest, again, feet of clay. Um, <laughs> and I think there are some folks, Catholic workers today that view the Catholic worker almost as their church. Um, but Definitely for Peter and Dorothy, the Catholic worker was not their church. Church was the church. <laughs> the Catholic the worker movement was a social program. And that's how that's why Peter could bring in people who weren't Catholic or sometimes interact with, you know, uh, people of all different backgrounds or have or at least initially be inviting them to roundtable discussions when he thought they were, you know, initially when he thought these would be monthly ordeals that would bring hundreds of people, <laughs> which didn't turn out that way. But he was hoping it wouldn't just be Catholics. He wanted this to be a program that brought more people together. I think the reality was it mainly only attracted Catholics. So some Catholic workers became perhaps what might be termed as semi-monastic with regular prayers. And I mean, obviously, Peter's initial vision in the early 30s, writing on houses of hospitality didn't include evening liturgy of the hours because they were just hoping the bishops would do it. it it was he never got that detailed in his blueprints and he never wanted to get too detailed because he always as he stated when people pushed him for details he wanted to make sure there was room for adaptation and changing situations sure makes sense and to some extent the fact that you know there there's this umbrella where there are Moronites, maybe we call the people you're talking about dayites. Again, we're being <laughs> crude and loose and using these people like archetypes. Yeah. Like the fact that all these people um, can still more or less identify as Catholic workers is seems to me pretty clearly a legacy of that ecumenical posture. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I had I have one question for you, big one. So, and you can take a pass on this if you want, but. Um, if you could change one thing at the national level, you know, in our economy or government, and you could change one thing in the Catholic worker movement, <laughs> 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 what are those things? Um, initially, these things might seem con to contradict one another, but on the national level, um, if I yeah, if I could say there'd be one policy that'd be put in place tomorrow, uh, it would be for um, it'd be for the guaranteed income. Um, I just think of all the families that have come through Casa Maria that you know in Wisconsin we call it the welfare to work program, and they need to be putting in all these hours while their kids are in daycare and. They're getting $650 a month, which if they're putting in all their hours at their work training placement, you know, they might be making technically like $5 an hour, <laughs> you know, so it's, it just seems like the total wrong way to support. Again, I think it's because of the notion of the welfare queen that this hideous form of welfare now exists in the United States. Um, it would eliminate welfare. It would eliminate um 
the need for all these middle people who make money off of enacting these programs. And it would act, I think it would also permit people. I think there might be other people that would be interested in doing something like the Catholic worker, or even trying to start a Catholic worker farming commune that are very afraid to take that leap <laughs> because it's a leap into uncertainty, perhaps giving up a job that they don't know if they'll be able to get back if they can't make a go of it and lose the land or can't make the rent or uh, uh, um, the payments for it. And so I think it would allow um, for perhaps a greater opportunity for trying out Peter's vision of distributism. Uh, Peter was probably more unique among the distributists with his anarchy. I mean, I'll say he's an anarchist, even though he never called himself one. <laughs> Dorothy called, said he was one. Um, but I think one of the arguments to say that Peter was an anarchist is that he never pushed for any legislation to help distributism come into place, where the English distributists that he adored so fondly, <laughs> you know, they were pushing for legislation that would allow people to actually go back to the land and survive. Because if you're trying to create things, but the, you know, but Walmart exists, I mean, we'll just say now, if you're, <laughs> if you're, if now you want to do something on the land and you're doing some arts and crafts and trying to survive on that, you know, people who have money can afford it. But if someone else wants to buy a basket, well, they can buy a basket for $2 at Walmart. Why would they pay you $20 or more for your very nice basket? Uh, but if there was something like um, a guaranteed income, I think it would allow for a more, a possible movement to a distributed society. Maybe then the guaranteed income wouldn't be needed anymore. <laughs> I think a lot of people would quit jobs at Walmart, McDonald's. It would defund. It would. It would make these jobs much more difficult to place. Um, so that that would be for on the U.S. level um, among the Catholic worker movement. Um, I don't know. I know. Uh, Maybe just more regular national gatherings. <laughs> uh, I think the ability of people, uh, different Catholic workers to get together is really helpful. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, many of the people that have been in the Milwaukee worker over the years are just more interested in the work. And I feel there's a disconnect from the greater movement. Uh, but that's been one of the blessings of having Sugar Creek, as we call it, our Midwest Catholic worker gathering, when I can get a few of those folks and drag them with me to the Midwest Catholic Worker Gathering. Um, it really, I think, helps them see that this is part of something bigger. And if people then get interested, I think that often is the true stepping stone for some folks to dive more into Peter Morin and Dorothy Day when they see how other people are doing doing this work in different ways and how meaningful it is for them in their lives. Uh, just that getting together, I feel is very important. Wow. Those are both good ideas. I, I do basically agree on that basic income too. I mean, it's not, it's not the ideal solution, but I think it would go a long way and it would definitely shake things up. I agree with that because basically what we have now with welfare to work is subsidized low wage labor for corporations and you know put off into this guise of you know we don't want people to be lazy but actually we're just like making them work at at you know substandard pay um because that's what keeps our economy going so yeah i i agree um yeah i mean in a way we're trying to be this kind of like in the morning academy we're trying to be this point of contact with catholic workers um and so we're always, you know, we're hoping that that some of the folks will will hear this and some of the other things we've done. And uh, we do we're doing a roundtable pretty soon at the end of January. It is online, which I know is not exactly <laughs> totally perfect, but um, but we're going to do that twice a year. And a lot of a lot of our courses are also basically 
some kind of round table. Um, so hopefully in our own way, we're kind of contributing to that because it is a very far flung movement and it really helps to have these conversations like we're having here. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree. I think, you know, a more openness to doing a few things online, not that it is everything we do, but I, I feel it's been so helpful. Shortly after the beginning of COVID, there was an online national Catholic worker gathering and it was a great upper. I mean, I remember they just had like one computer set up in the kitchen of the Los Angeles Catholic worker. And we could see there were like 10 of them there together in the room all around one computer together. And it was, you know, during this time of during that time of isolation it, or it's just so great to be with other folks. But also what you're doing allows for people that to get together from different parts of the country on a somewhat regular basis that wouldn't be able to. So it's I think it definitely is a good complement to the Catholic worker movement. Yeah, we're hoping so. Um, well, thank you. And thank for thank you for coming on for this interview. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Very good to meet you, Spencer and Laurie.